computers. Ah, there we go. Computers. go. There yeah, we yeah, go. Yeah. Yes, in my bathtub, it's pretty cool, right? Yes, we love it. Yes, right? yes, I love it. That's <laughs> flipping awesome. I love that. There's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah, in, I saw yeah. that in, in the storyboard. Was, uh, I found out stuff about me I didn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay. So. All right. All right, there. Oh, actually, no, sorry. But actually, before we start, I just wanted to find out uh, the pronunciation of uh, your surname. Is it? Uriah. Uriah. Okay, Uriah. Awesome. Cool. It's been wrecked by many before, so don't stress. But it's Uriah. <laughs> no, no, it's nice to know that. You don't want to go, ah, and it's Steve Uriah. Uriah. Yeah, and you're like, yeah, no, I've, been, I've been called waste product of urine many times. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's classic. Okay, cool. Waking at dawn. Back. All right. So good afternoon there, Steve Uriah from New York City. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Um, Steve, we actually got in touch with you, or I got in touch with you, touch with you about, I'd say like six months ago, because a common friend of ours, uh, John John Park, he actually mentioned me, he mentioned you to me and he's like, oh, you've really got to chat to this guy, Steve. He's doing like phenomenal things. So, you know, it's been a kind of while in the making and we're just really glad that we now have this opportunity to speak with you. Well, it's a pleasure to be on. Thank you. Yeah, John John's been a, an older brother, mentor, best friend. Uh, you know, his dad was, was a, a role model to me and actually my mentor. Uh, originally, I'm very grateful I had the opportunity to train under edge, to learn from him, to be in his presence, to feel his energy. And then moved to, uh, when I moved to LA, which we'll get to later, I actually worked with John John there. So yeah, lots, lots of roots. Uh, that's so cool. Well, you've, uh, you've kind of already answered one of the things I wanted to find <laughs> out, which is great. But, okay, um, but I'm a forward thinker. No, of course, man. No, no. So, so, you know, like part of the podcast is understanding like a bit about you and your backstory. I know that, you know, you grew up in Johannesburg wow. in a sort of tight Jewish community and you started bodybuilding when you were 16 years old. And I think you were encouraged by your parents. They sort of inspired you. So can you just sort of take us a little bit back, you know, into sort of what it was like for you to grow up in Johannesburg? Yeah, absolutely. So, Grew up in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg, obviously the 70s, early 80s as, as a child. Um, tight Jewish community, not so much. I mean, uh, Orthodox Jewish, uh, based on the fact that in South Africa at the time there was Orthodox and Reform, we didn't have all the offshoots like you have today with liberal, conservative, whatever else. I mean, especially in the United States, it's like diluted down to the most unimaginable <laughs> breakdown of Judaism. But yeah, so I went to Orthodox synagogue on high holidays and on Shabbat or, you know, but I wasn't an observant Jew. We were more uh, festival celebrated the, the high holidays. Um, but yeah, I definitely raised Jewish. Um, I never went to a Jewish day school. I, I went to public or government schools um, when I grew up. Uh, my cousins and a lot of my family did go to Jewish school. I didn't. And I'm, I'm quite, I'm, I've got mixed feelings. I think that I'm quite grateful that I integrated with what I found the real world. <clears throat> Excuse my voice, I've been teaching crazy again. Um, but having experienced life from all different types of uh, race, well, at the time it wasn't race, I guess, because of apartheid for years, but it was different religious backgrounds and families. It was <clears throat> crucial for me to, develop as a human being, having that, that type of schooling, um, you know, as opposed to the sheltered Jewish community schooling that they had at the time. So, uh, yeah, I, I went to public schools. Within that, there was a certain amount of anti-Semitism that I experienced, um, uh, bullying, you know, all those things that, as a smaller Jewish guy, sort of primed me for aspiring to being more and, and having not tolerating um, abuse. Um, and by that, I mean bullying. You know, in the school systems, there were uh, a lot of different guys there and there was rugby and it was, it was you know, Jewish guys don't play rugby generally, a few have. Um, 
But I was always an individual sports kind of guy. I liked golf at the time, which was very young. It wasn't a junior sport much then. I played golf and I played tennis, so I didn't participate in team sports as much. So I liked I liked to be responsible from a very young age for my own losses and victories. I didn't want to be blamed for a loss or a victory or, or, or taking uh, credit for a victory on a sporting team when I didn't feel like I added value, um, which was my own shift as a kid. And I always stayed in the individual um, realm and I was very good at it. I excelled in that. And actually, um, I did also do Taekwondo from a young age. Um, so martial arts sort of gave me that confidence, uh, you know, as a, as a kid coming up to, to defend myself as well. Um, and then at about 16 years old, I got into a confrontation with several guys. And, and after that, I decided to, to get stronger. You know, like the black cat peanut butter ad, the guy kicked down. <laughs> I'm like, this, I'm going to take it to another level. So, <laughs> you know, I, I then started working out with, um, it wasn't really for my parents' encouragement, it was my, uh, my uncle was, was training a lot then, and I joined him at Stan Schmidt Gym, which at the time was um, in uh, quite nearby my house. And I started training, and, and obviously Stan Schmidt Center was a karate school. Um, but downstairs, his, his son-in-law, Mark, I uh, had a, a, a gym um, and I, I joined there. I started to train there. He started training me. Um, I fell in love with it from the very beginning. I loved the, the push. I loved the drive. I loved the results. I loved seeing the change. And <clears throat> then I found Reg, uh, luckily Reg Park. So he then took me under his wing, uh, started mentoring me and and I just... I, was, I just wanted to study human movement. I was fascinated by it, and it became my my life mission, which gets me to yeah. But um, yeah, I think that it was it was myself who, who decided to go in, and then I'm the kind of person as when I do something, I do it all in, or I don't do it at all. And <laughs> yeah, so when I started training there, I remember myself and Gary Lowenstein uh, is another, he's a, a yeah. very good yeah. friend of mine. He's a trainer in, in South Africa. He worked with me in Atlanta for many years. Uh, him, myself, Lance Jacobs, and I can name a few of the old Jewish boys from back in the day. We were in the first group of personal trainers in South Africa, really, in, in, uh, in the eighties, you know, like 85. Uh, it was just becoming a thing, a personal trainer. That's when in Hollywood, the uh, elite had their personal trainers. And yeah, I started back then. That's cool, man. Yes. And and, and yes. do, do you mind just sort of telling me a little bit about Reg, what he was like as a person? Because I, I never had the, you know, I, I never actually got to meet him, unfortunately. Right. Um, and I just he, hear so he was, many great was, things from John John. He was huge, both in person and in a personality. Uh, genius with the human body. Uh, I'll tell you, like, you know, as a, a guy starting out and working out, everybody bench presses. It's like the first question is, what do you bench? You know, like, <laughs> whatever. He, when I first saw him, you know, everyone wants this big manly chest. And I'll tell you, the first meeting I had with him, I was sitting across from him at a table, and he goes, put your feet flat on the ground, lad. You know, he called me lad. When you're talking, when you're talking sit up straight. Uh, just a strong, strong demeanor. And he would give me a program, and, and it would be a six-week program. And he'd say, this is what I want you to do for six weeks. And then, you know, in three weeks, come back and see me. We'll see how you're looking. And then you'll come back again. We'll give you a new program. And I was so disappointed because the first program he gave me, and I had a weak chest. You know, I was quite a skinny kid. And I had no chest. And all I wanted was a chest. And I was <laughs> just end up focusing on their whole lives. And it was a press. Anyway, it was six. Oh. I still remember I was 17. It was six sets of cable crossovers. <laughs> two percented with push-ups and that was it and I questioned him I had the audacity to say but hang on what about chest press he said lad six weeks <laughs> and we did measurements and and uh, yeah, six sets of 20 reps which was ridiculous and and also calves you know he's like I want you to get on and do 20 sets of calves yeah like, god you know he's like anyway six weeks later my chest was massively improved Wow. And I just gained so much trust in him and 
just the way he looks at the human structure, the body, the, 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 the way he prescribed exercises for people. So I used to go with a, a female, was my training partner at the time, and just the whole eating plan and the whole, the way he was, the level of trust I had for him. If he literally said to me, I, you know, I want you to do, you know, no biceps for the six weeks, I wouldn't do it. Um, yeah. And my body changed and my mindset changed. You know, he, as you know, trained Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, Arnold even spoke about him. There's a motivational thing going around on Facebook with Arnold talking about the important things in life. And in there, he said, I wanted to be like Reg Park. I wanted to be in the movies. I wanted to be Hercules. Mm. And and Reg was his motivation. And, uh, you know, for, for me, I'm so blessed to have had Reg and then John John, who's equally a student and a, and a, a person who's dedicated their entire being to helping others. Um, mm. As has Gary and Lance and all the guys I mentioned, we're purists, we're passionate, we live for what we do, we we are walking, uh, uh, we attribute our bodies to the lifestyle we lead. I mean, we're all 50s, you know, now, and we'll, we'll compete, and when I say compete, all day long physique-wise with 20-year-olds <laughs> yeah. because we've lived it, believed in it, and never diverted. You know, I, I, I believe truly in life. If you have a passion, uh, you live it, you believe in it 1 million percent, you'll succeed in in that, even as an entrepreneur, to, to take away from, like people said, fuck, you're going to New York, are you crazy? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm just believing in, uh, oh, you're chasing your dream. No, I'm not. It's not a dream. A dream stays a dream. It's a vision. And a vision is something that you work on and you believe in and you have tenacity and balls and will and drive and you never give up. And something Reg taught me, something life taught me, something military taught me is, you know, there's that saying, but did you die? <laughs> That's, <laughs> yeah. the truth. That's the truth. Uh, don't complain because did you die? Fuck, yeah. and you can go. Got two choices yeah. in life. And, you know, you can lie down and, and self-pity and misery, or you can get up and fuck shit up, honestly. And, and that's been my belief in everything. I've recreated myself five times um, in life. And by that, I mean, I've literally restarted and, and rekindled and uh, all in the same passion of fitness and, and human movement. But five times I've, I've actually started again. And mm -hmm. I've loved it every single time. I've had frustrations, of course, but I've had belief always. And, you know, I'm, I'm diverting from the question, but, you know, you said we go all over the place. I'm, a, I'm the king of that. So. <laughs> <laughs> but Steve, you're talking about that grit. I mean, that you've obviously gotten a massive amount of, of the strength and grit within you from these people, from your upbringing, from being oh. bullied or whatever it may be. But, oh. um, you know, you served in the, the, the South African Air Force yes. and uh, you, you had a, a heart murmur. Um, and but but that didn't stop you, so that's part of your grit. So how did well, how did that whole story go down? So basically, finished uh, Randolph Afrikaans University Sports Administration. That was another thing, quite a difficult degree to do in Afrikaans. Um, yes. Which yeah, which which was great uh, challenge wise. Also uh, taught me about tenacity, about belief, about drive, about the ability to achieve. You know so. I finished that and when I finished, I was actually a monster in size. At the same time, I was bouncing at Idols Nightclub in Joburg, in Hillbrow. Um, I actually, you know, I don't, I don't hide from the fact I'd done steroids prior to going into the military. I was a monster. I was literally, I think I weighed about 95 kilograms. Okay, I'm all of five, seven and a half. So I was a, wow. I mean, I was a, <laughs> I was a big, I was like bigger with than heart wise <laughs> I had this long hair it was the 80s down you know my back um, and I went in and and they did they did pick up that I had a heart movement and I have a hernia, an umbilical hernia, hernia since I was born it was quite funny all the King David first team rugby boys were coming into the Air Force with doctors notes to try and get you know you had G1 G1 through G5 medical which meant you know G1 K1 meant full exemption you could do everything up to G5 was exempt. So they found these things, sent me to one more hospital and they said, yeah, you'll be a G3, which is light PT and office work. And I looked at the doctor and I said, I've got two choices for you. I said, either give me a G1 
or give me a free five. Because if you put me in an office, I'm not going to be in a military hospital again. I'm going to be in military jail. I said, I don't do office. I said, look at me. I said, do I look like I need live PT? I mean, I was a monster. And he yes. said, no one's ever asked for this. I said, trust me. And he still, <laughs> he said, Here's your death. He still said, here's your death certificate and gave it to me. No uh, worries. I was hoping for a G5, actually, but, but I went with a G1. Um, and I loved it. I fucking, you know, like I said, if I do anything, I'm going all in. And, and I went in and I, I actually had a, a, an incident third day in, in, uh, in basic training. We hadn't got our uniforms yet. I still had my long hair and I hadn't shaved. I mean, everyone was in civvy still. They were still giving us the run around. And I was walking one of the, um, one of the PTRs came up to me in Afrikaans and, and screamed at me, why haven't you shaved? And I was fluent from, from Rand Afrikaans University, but I didn't speak to him in Afrikaans. I refused. I said, <laughs> uh, I haven't shaved because we're not in uniform yet. He said, and yeah, yes, yeah, so I fucking knew it. Oh, wow. I know for a fact there's two things that you can't do, and one is religion, and one is politics. They can't mention those things. I knew the laws, hmm. so I hit him. Whoa! I, mean, I, I hit him, and he's a senior officer, but he's a PTI. Wow. Two guys were standing with him who were PTIs, and they ran at me, and and they stood up, and I jumped back, and they said to me, "Do you want to press charges?" To me, wow. and I, said, I said to them both, I said, from today on, I want you to know one thing. I said, forget what just happened. I said, do whatever the fuck you want to me. I said, but don't talk about my religion to me ever again. And you tell everybody in this camp, I'm here, wow. I serve just like you are. Listen, I was fucking relieved it went that way because I didn't know which way it was going to go. But from that no, time, yes. they called me Spira and, and Muscles and their goal was to get me to lose 16 kilos. And I said to them, doesn't matter, let's go. And we did. And I lost all of 14 kilos in, in six weeks. It was insane. But I loved it. And, and I was, you know, I was the flick full of my, of my unit. I was, uh, I, I just embraced the fact, because I had, again, two choices. Either, you, either you're going to go all in or you're just wasting your time. You know? And that's something I preach when I teach my classes. Yeah, it's like, don't waste your fucking time go as hard as you can or, or don't cut. You know, it's, it's, I can tell a, a million things about a person by the way they work out. Um, work ethic, strength of character, uh, how far they can push. And listen, I thrived. I went further than most Jewish guys have been in, in the military. Um, came out with medals for outstanding service. I rewrote the induction processes. I trained all the high-ranking officers um, I was in the, I actually ended up in the Kufut, which was the SAP Special Forces um, unit in Pretoria, and was with those guys who were some of the craziest people I've ever come across. I mean, those are the most highly trained guys I've ever been around. And learning from them and watching them and how they adjusted and adapted to, they've all just come out of the Caprivi Strip in Angola at the time, you know, they've been probably on the border seen I uh, saw photographs and stories and you can imagine um but anyway it was a, it was a very very interesting time for me uh you know we, our, our division at the end we were in the in the graduates uh, cabins or the, the, the there was the grads and the non-grads so the, the non-grads all the kids that just finished school and they were you know they, they we used to make a joke they loved the army because they could grow their hair and wear shoes um, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I came to the military just forced to the war, young athletes and whatever. And we had a competition in our final before we finished up our basic training or boot camp. We had a competition. It was I think six or eight on eight uh, grads against uh, wing one against wing two, and uh, it was it was an obstacle course type thing, but with also some skill sets. I mean strength and and. We had to pull a truck, one of those big military trucks. We had to do shit across ropes and whatever. And we slayed these kids. I mean, we finished about <laughs> two and a half minutes ahead of them. Wow. And that was probably one of the proudest moments, really, uh, because it was so physically and mentally demanding. And we were like the heroes of, of the boot camp, which was pretty cool. And But I learned a lot. Listen, I learned, you know, I mean, I also figured out how to use my, I don't know if you call it Jewish chutzpah, maybe. Uh, I had bodybuilding pass during basics, so I would get out every evening for three hours and 
I would go pick up Kentucky rounders to bring back so the guys would make my bed and do my clothes. It was pretty smart. <laughs> um, but it was a, it was a, it was a, I think most men should, and I say men to learn and grow up and realize what your, what your, what your lack of limit is. You have none. Mm -hmm. How you can survive and how you can make a plan and how you can figure shit out. That was my best training for life right there is is to to survive and make a plan and i think it molded me into the man i, I am today I, I i believe everything happens because it's supposed to we are where we're supposed to be i mean i'm sitting in new york city my wife and three kids are in cape town it's, it's a fucked up situation but again i have the ability to be here because my wife believes in what i'm doing she's amazing in that i don't know many wives who would tolerate that Mm -hmm. um, but for the betterment of my family in the future, I just believe that the playing field of New York City and the scope, you know, I think the, the American dream lives in New York City. I've lived in Los Angeles and Atlanta, Georgia for many years, and they're cool uh, as far as a, a, a city to live in. But, you know, I, I read an article from actually, it's one of my competitors. He's a trainer at, at, at another concept, and he pegged it perfectly. He said, we don't pay the physical and financial taxes in New York City to be mediocre. Mm. And that's the thing that we, nobody here, and again, I'm diverting, uh, in New York City is here to be mediocre. So anyone who's here is here to shoot the lights out and be the best of the best. And the cliche of if you make it there, you'll make it anywhere. You know, we've all sung it and fuck, what does it mean? Trust me, it means the world. Because I draw on the same survival mechanisms living here every day that I did in boot camp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Physically, uh, in every way. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm diverting, but go on. No, that's cool, man. I, I'm actually just wondering if you like have got these telepathic uh, powers because you've kind of just answered about like 10 questions in a row. Which, <laughs> Listen, which, okay, I'll get this done. I'm, 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 which we had for you. But, but no, we <laughs> talk about mindset, right? And like, you know, right. how, how the army helped you. How, are there certain things or techniques that you learned from, you know, from being in the army in terms of mindset and how do you sort of, um, how important do you think mindset is compared to say anything else that, uh, you know, that I honestly do? believe that minds survival belief, uh, trusting the process. I believe the university of life and, and yeah, uh, I guess you know what you think about it this way: you finish school, whether you when you were you were in matric, you were the man, you were the oldest, you were the priakas, you were the big deals. Uh, you finish university, you've been jawling. I was at nightclubs. I was like, you know, people wanted me to be their mate so I could get them through the VIP line, and just in life, you you figure you wangle things. Then you go into this institution where you become nobody. So you're stripped of everything that you've gained for 18 or 20 years of your life gets taken away. You get a brown uniform, you lose your name, you become a number, they shave your head. I literally felt like as in a Pink Floyd video at the wall, you know, when you saw the guys all marching into a mince machine and coming out mincemeat. That's what it felt like when you went in because, you know, you got your family and your friends and you're the hero of your group and you're the man. Like I said, now you're sitting, you're walking in a line, some young kid screaming at you. You have to listen to them. You can't argue. You have to, you have to listen to what they're saying. And you, you stand in this line. You, you, you're, you're given a number. Like I said, you report as that number. You, you don't use your name any longer. You wait for your meals. You get the same shit on your plate that everyone else does. You may, when you make your bed, it's got to, it took an hour and 20 minutes to make a bed. And, and I literally mean, wow. They, wow. So it's a piece of foam mattress, not covered in Bates foam. Uh, and you know, it's, it's got a, it's, it's dented in in the middle. We literally had to put clothes pegs between the, the, the bottom of the bed and the, and the mattress. Then you'd make this bed, you'd measure angles with your farkpan, which was your eating tray. You would use shaving cream and a boot brush and an iron to tabletop the edges of the, of the sheets so that it looked like yeah. a table. I mean, and these guys would come in at three in the morning and make you put on your full uniform go to the parade ground, they've sprayed it down, roll in the sand, call the sugar cookies, go get into your bed, in your wet shit, 
and have a full inspection three hours later. Now there were no washing machines. It was hand washing. So your uniform, your bed, everything had to be done from three in the morning and your inspection was at 5.30. So it was just constant mind fucks and breaking. And this is also where I learned, I said earlier that I was an individual sports guy. I didn't believe in team. I didn't want to let anyone down. This is where I learned that you're part of a unit and that you you bring people up. And, and that helped me also with the fundamentals of what I do today is I'm standing in front of 80 people in a room commanding them and making them believe that they can do shit that they don't believe they can do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I started the first ever boot camp and I'm probably answering another question now, but um, <laughs> when I was in Atlanta in 80, whatever it was, uh, no, excuse me, 2005, six or whatever, because of my military background, one of the concepts I created was boot camp and I took people outside and, 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 and it's now the staple in many gyms across the world, the boot camp. That was one of my concepts that I founded. I was on CNN with Sanjay Gupta because I was the wellness correspondent with him living in Atlanta. But my, my point here is that in boot camp, we used to scream at people and tell them that they were losers if they can't do push-ups. I've evolved to a point now that I don't do that. I'm, I'm of a nurturing type now where I tell people, let me hold your hand and show you you can do push-ups. So mm. the delivery has changed in, in a maturing way that I don't believe breaking down people to show them they can be better is necessarily great in a civilian world. In the military, you have to because you have to command that respect and belief. But it did work for boot camp. I mean, I had 80 people. It was the most profitable business I've ever had in my life. I was charging $20 a head in a park, no overhead, and I had 80 people to 100 people a day. Uh, it was insane. Um, however, you know, now, yeah, so what I learned basically to answer the question again is, is I just think the power of belief and knowing that, again, but did you die? You know, so you got drilled, you got drilled through the night, you had to lean against the wall with your rifle in front of you in a squat, and if one guy puts their arms down, you all start again. And constant what they call box, which is, is just to break you and, and then remold you into the machine they needed. Um, you realize that as a human being, we're actually brilliant machines. I mean, think about it in a lot of ways. A guy or a person will go out on a Saturday night and drink themselves into oblivion. They're vomiting, and the next day you can't stand up, you can't eat, you're a disaster, and two days later you're back because your body repairs. Yeah. It's brilliant. Uh, and this is what I tell people. You know, your body is the most amazing machine, um, and we're fortunate enough to live in it, and it'll do and it'll deliver if you look after, you know, if you, if you believe uh, anyway, that's the answer, I guess. Steve, I wanted to ask you just talking about, you know, that, that mental toughness, but also being uh, like sort of in group art group with you being Jewish in the army and that kind of thing. Was there any of that with being a South African in, uh, in America? And ha did you draw on yeah. sort of that aspect of things? So, so when I first moved to Los Angeles in, 91, I believe it was. I went to train. Firstly, when I arrived there, I was driving with a friend uh, from the airport and he was, this is the Mexican area. This is the black area. This is, and I looked at him, I said, what do you mean? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm from South Africa and I know there was apartheid there, but I thought everyone was like cool here. So that was my first experience that racism didn't just live in South Africa. You know, I was, I was, I had a misconception in my mind that it, the only difference with South Africa is it was a written law. And about four months after I got there, the Rodney King beating happened and mm -hmm. the riots in LA and we had curfews and fuck, I just left South Africa, not because of apartheid, but because of opportunity. I, uh, you know, it was very much during, it was still in, in apartheid South Africa at the time, you know, it was 91. And um, so that was a bit of a mess for me to, I was disillusioned because I didn't think it lived there. And then I was training in a, in a gym called uh, LA Fitness at the time or whatever it was, I don't remember. And I was, I was on a bench and I was working out in this monster named Victor Richards. I still remember his name. He wasn't a pro bodybuilder because he was just too big. He was one of the yeah. biggest human beings <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. You can Google him. I mean, he was, he was an enigma. <laughs> and he came up and he said to me how, long, how many sets and when I answered him he said where are you from man and I said South Africa and he said you motherfuckers 
you're killing my sisters and my brothers. And I looked at him, I said, can I ask you a question? He said, yes. I said, why aren't you there? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? I said, if you struggle, if you want to, if you want to stand there and talk about your brothers and sisters, why don't you go help them? He said, what do you mean? I said, am I there? I said, what do you mean? I said, are you talking to me or am I in South Africa? He said, what do you mean, man? I said, I'm here because I don't fucking believe in the politics there. That's why I'm standing in front of you. Anyway, listen, thank God it went that way too for me because <laughs> I mean, he probably weighed 340 pounds of muscle. His arms were probably 24 inch. Right? He was a monster. I mean, seriously, okay. looking at some time, Victor Richards. Anyway, after that, I used to see him in the gym always and he used to call me Mr. South Africa. Uh, <laughs> but I actually was a lot of times back then on many occasions of people as well as from and I'd say Rhodesia or Zimbabwe because I didn't want to get into it because they didn't understand. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people said to me, you're from South Africa, but you're white. Yeah. Like, but, but am I? <laughs> and, then <I'd> say, <laughs> and, then I, and then I'd say to me, but you speak great English. I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> thank you. And I've only been here for a few months. Uh, but it was very weird. Like one time I went to, I was in a restaurant and I said to the, I went to the maitre d'I said, excuse me, where's the toilet? And she went, it's in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I learned very quickly how to speak the language, you know. That's to, classic. American, because, yeah, I know it's in the bathroom. Thank you. I didn't think it was in the <laughs> Anyway, um, so yeah, I did have some, I did have some, some race uh, or, or, or some issues because of apartheid South Africa. But I stood my ground pretty strong. I've been through the military and and I, I'd seen a lot and been through a lot. And I and I, I honestly, you know, I don't believe in oppression on any level. I don't believe in fanaticism on every level. Extremism, Jewish, Arab, Muslim. I, I think everybody's in you know innately a good person. But mm. you're going to have extremists on either side. And I. You know, I don't have tolerance of people judging me because they don't know me. They don't know what I've done. They don't know, did, did I sit at Wits University and, and riot because I wanted rights? They don't know. They have no idea. So to judge me because I'm a white South African is, is an unfair thing and I didn't stand for it. So, yeah, but I did deal with it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and it's, uh, it's funny. Uh, I worked in America for a little bit uh, when I was younger and, like, I remember uh, one of the guys asked me where I was from and he's like, uh, I said, oh, I'm from South Africa. He goes, Oh, right. oh man, which state is that? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, uh, it's actually, it's near Hawaii. Like, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, like, they're clueless. They're clueless. And, and you have giraffe and, and lions in your yard. And, you know, I used to play around with a lot and say, yeah, yeah, I used to have a pet rhinoceros. And, yeah, you know, riding on the back of an elephant. elephant. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you can you can really sort of have a good laugh at them, that's for sure. <laughs> no doubt. I mean, it's. Uh, it's interesting that American history uh, or history in school is American history, and that's where it ends. Uh, in mm -hmm. college, obviously, they uh, expand, but in school, you learn American, uh, and that's it. You know, every state, you have to know the Constitution and all the stuff, but nothing outside. I mean, when the war in Iraq happened, I think people asked if that was a threat to my family in South Africa. You know, that's literally the geography of knowledge. <laughs> wow. So, now, Steve, you, you mentioned boot camp a moment ago, but you're... Um, yeah. Certainly a serial entrepreneur, and uh, you're always reinventing yourself and businesses, etc. You've started uh, Blast 900, Sweat right. 1000, Switch Playground, and what what drives you in your life to seek these new ventures? And can we talk a little bit about those? You know what? Uh, it's just been an organic progress or process, I should say. It's. Um, you know what, I, I still remember when I was in LA, before I started working with John John, I, I bought an old uh, SUV and weights, and I used to drive from home to home, um, training people for $20 an hour. I would unload all the benches and dumbbells and go up these stairs. I still remember, I used to go to a couple that were psychiatrists at 4.30 in the morning in the valley. It was like a 20 minute drive. And, um, I would walk up the stairs, the dogs would bite my ankles. They hated me, those dogs, I don't know why. <laughs> we had to listen to the Beach Boys albums every single time, three days a week, same album. <laughs> um, the beauty of it is they were actually Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys psychiatrist and they ended up having me train him, which was wow. a, great, uh, yeah. a great 
he was my first super celebrity, I guess. He was very, very messed up, uh, though, and unfortunately, from whatever happened to him in his life. Um, but he was a super cool guy, and he would come with two caregivers, and I would train him. Sometimes he'd <laughs> leave 10 minutes in and say, I have to go, voices in my head. You know, he was, he was pretty messed up. And wow. I remember wow. one morning on my knee, the, the woman was squatting, and the dog was ripping my face off, and I was listening to these voices. <laughs> And I made a conscious decision there and then. I said, I'm going to be the best personal trainer in the world. And I was 22 years old. Wow. And I, I don't know where it came from. It just came, it was like this epiphany. It just happened, this light bulb moment. And that was it for me. You know, I, um, I then just started to, I, I, someone's called me a, what did they call me? And uh, they coined a phrase for me. It was the, I'll, I'll get it in a second. It was, it was about, it was to do with my creativity, my intuition with what's next, the next big thing in fitness. Um, but, you, you know, I went from, from that moment to working with John John. I ended up training Oscar De La Hoya at Big Bear, California. I ended up training on the set of Stan Winston movies, Jurassic Park. I trained the guys in the dinosaur suits. Wow. So LA was a fun time for me. You know, I got to do those fun things, the, the California living, you know. Um, a conceptual athlete is what I've been called. Uh, quite an interesting term. But, you know, I, I got my fundamentals of fitness. I did my training. I moved after the Northridge earthquake. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia with my wife. Then it was not my wife yet, but we met in LA. She's an ex-South African. Um, when I first arrived in the U.S. on my way to LA, I landed in Atlanta and, and I was with my father and he had some friends and I thought it was a beautiful place, really amazing green lakes, trees, very much like Johannesburg. Mm. And then I arrived in LA and I thought, fuck, it's a concrete crack mess traffic. But anyway, I spent four years in LA after the Northridge quake, went to Atlanta, ended up buying a home, putting a personal training gym in the basement. And I was the first personal training gym or one of the first in Atlanta. And within, within, I think, a year, I had 12 trainers and cars in my yard out the door. It was a problem. My wife threw me out with the, with the clients. <laughs> down in the morning at 6.30, there'd be people in the kitchen drinking coffee, and it was a bit uncomfortable. But when we had my son, uh, about six months after we had my, my son, Shane, I bought a building in, in Buckhead, which is an affluent area in Atlanta, and 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 had a, a probably the most successful personal training gym in Atlanta at the time. It was written up in Harper's Bazaar magazine as the top 15 gyms in America. Um, wow. Great credibility. I trained the CEOs of Coca-Cola and um, very very affluent clients because all the Fortune 500 companies had head offices in Atlanta. So mm -hmm. I was fortunate with CNN and all these things. Um, but it wasn't enough for me. I, I wanted more. I've always wanted more. Even when I was there, I've always wanted to be in New York because this is the mecca of boutique fitness at the main stage. Uh, sometimes I question why the fuck I did want that, but, but I'm here. Um, again, striving entrepreneurial spirit. It's not about having, it's not a money thing for me. I'm not looking to be a hundred million dollar man. I'm, I'm looking to share my love and passion with as many people as I can helping others be better every day. In fact, our, our ethos and one of our brand our mission statements is to help others. We stand for change, uh, you know, a whole lot of things. But, um, you know, once I, I, I had this, I started working with some of the NFL players. So I got approached by a, um, one of my clients and asked if I would work with a, an American football player named Jamal Lewis who was on the Baltimore Ravens, which is one of the NFL teams. He was a running back. He was a superstar out of college, first round pick um, from Tennessee. He was a party boy though. He weighed 265 or 270. They needed him to go into the season at 235. So they asked if I'd work with him. Of course I'm gonna work with the guy. He was a super cool guy. Yeah. And at the time what I'd done is, <laughs> Next door, my building in, in Atlanta was an old house that a, an older woman owned, and she then sublet it out to a, a brothel, which was quite cool because we used to watch all these things <laughs> going on in there. Um, <laughs> I came to work in the police, and then they were arresting the whole place. They, they, they were done. Big L, the pimp, who was actually quite a cool guy, was done. His, his business was closed. And then I rented the brothel. Um, 
turned it into a boxing room. I mean, this little old Georgia cottage had 12 bags hanging in what used to be the living room and, uh, and a little ring in the one sun porch. And I turned this into my first boxing studio. So when Jamal came to me, I, uh, I started training him a, as if he was getting ready for a fight. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what football players, I didn't even know what American football was. I mean, I watched it. I didn't understand it. I was a rugby guy. You know, we knew rugby from South Africa. And I had no idea. I just guys in helmets that were huge with pads, you know. So uh, they, uh, they said he's a running back. So I watched tape. I studied the movement demands on his body of a running back and researched it. And so I looked at what he needs to do. So I, I came up with a program where I said, listen, a lot of your footwork and your lateral movements and I did resistance bands and he'd never done that. And he'd bring his boys with him and they'd train. I mean, it was fun. But, you know, they would be jawling. They'd come to me after partying at seven in the morning and they'd be hungover. And I'd get in the boxing ring with five of these monsters and put the pads on and let them smash me around for, listen, they lasted about two minutes and then the hangover kicked in and then I dominated. But <laughs> as, as if he was getting ready for a fight. And, he went back to the season. I got him down to 240 or 237, which was amazing. Um, second game of that season, he broke the all-time NFL rushing record. Uh, he ran 295 yards, which if in football, a running back carries for 100 yards. It's considered an amazing game. Wow. And he did 295. I was on Fox Sports and ESPN with him. Then I got all the uh, agents calling me. I ended up training about 28 of these guys. Then Charles Barkley, the basketball player, came. Super cool guy. Listen, I had had the best life with this. I love what I do, and I've I've, I've loved working with people like that. When you get a superhuman athlete, uh, you know these guys are the absolute cream of the crop. If you think about it, in the NFL, there's X amount of teams. Um, every state has multiple colleges. They've all got football teams. At the end of every year, coming out prospects are probably about. I would say 2,000 guys who are highest level athletes for one position, you know. Mm -hmm. And when you make it into the NFL, you know that you are just special. You know, you're the highest, highest end athlete. These guys could run, they weight. Those big guys that people say, oh, they're fat. They, they might be heavy, but those guys on the front line, they'll run a 40 yards in, in four seconds. I mean, it's like getting hit by a pickup truck, you know. They, yeah. they, they can jump, they can turn, they can... They're, they're amazing. So anyway, it was beautiful to train them. I, I was honored to. I had fun with them. It was great. Um, my parking lot looked like a Dubai nightclub. I mean, you can imagine <laughs> Rolls Royces and Ferraris, $20,000 wheels, and it was pretty cool. Um, but I still wanted more. Um, I, I just, I knew I have so much to give. So for me, personal training only allowed me to get to X people a day. Um, so then the boot camp came about. Uh, that was a huge success. Started that, uh, and it and it expanded. We had four parks going at one stage. I had instructors in all these parks doing all these boot camps. Probably at 140 to 180 people in, in an hour every morning across Atlanta. Uh, then a lot of my female clients loved the boxing idea with the NFL guys, and the sexual chemistry was amazing. So I, I went into Buckhead higher up and I rented a studio that I turned into the first boxing studio that wasn't for boxers. <laughs> it was 28 bags hanging a ring, counter, but it looked like the nicest boxing studio I ever seen, but I didn't have any fighters in there. It was me and all these NFL guys and these women and it just took off. And that was my next concept of the boot camp was this cardio kickboxing uh, phenomenon that I started. And that thing grew. I used to have people out the door on a Saturday. Um, it was amazing. It was beautiful. I, 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 then I implemented other stuff into there, like resistance training and uh, resistance bands with the boxing. And I just created, it just came to me. You know, it's like quite a forward thinking process. And then I actually I had a bit of extra space in the studio and I, I mentored a trainer that I'd met who was at the big commercial gym and he had some issues there. So I said, you know what, just take the back space from me. And he ended up being one of the superstar trainers on The Biggest Loser on NBC. He's, one of the, he's a legend now in fitness. I mean, I had Justin Bieber, Janet Jackson. They were all training in that studio in Atlanta. It was pretty cool. Um, 
And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to LA to visit and see what's happening in the industry. And I went and there was a concept called Burn 60. And Burn 60 was on treadmills. And what they did, Barry's Brew Camp was already born, which is one of the staples in, in group fitness worldwide. Now it's, it's amazing. It was treadmill and floor. And you do half the workout on the treadmill, half on the floor. And I loved it. I went to one class, came back to Atlanta and created my own program. And that became Blast 900, which was... Uh, I just basically molded everything I knew into this class, but I wasn't a runner ever, but I, I studied different movements on the treadmill and created this amazing concept called Blast 900. Um, again, belief in myself, uh, I invested probably about $400,000 into this concept. Uh, and I went in blind. I mean, I went to one class in LA. I liked the idea, I fine tuned it into my own idea, completely different than them. The premise was treadmill and floor, but I implemented boxing and suspension training and coming up and down. And I would call different speeds to the treadmill. It was like the most choreograph choreography I've ever had to do. I had a stopwatch on. I was calling speeds to three different fitness levels on the treadmill, training people on the floor on my own. So I'd have like 40, 70 people all going, doing different <laughs> in the room. And it, it, it also, by the time I finished that, I had four studios throughout Atlanta. Um, and then we decided to come back to South Africa, my wife and I, with our kids, to to spend six months in Cape Town showing our kids what South Africa was like. And we were going to move to Newport, California. And when I got to South Africa, I ended up training with some guys I knew, the Rothschild brothers, who had PUC, Jim, and C points. Um, and they, you know, they said train some clients, and I did. And then they said, well, your concept, you know, we, we have the free motion treadmills you used. Why don't we try the concept? Yeah, and we did. In the little studio there, I started it, I created it, and it took off. And, you know, then we went to Morningside in Joburg. And now, now boutique fitness didn't exist in South Africa. There was Virgin and Planet Fitness, I think. Yeah. And that was yeah. Oh, right. the big box gyms. I still remember some one of the Kugels in Santa saying, to me, <laughs> no one's going to pay... 180 rand for a, a class. We can get a virgin for 200 rand a month and do all the classes. And I said, you know what? That's your thought process, but I'm doing it. Anyway, we opened Morningside and that was probably the most successful store I've ever had. Um, we were turning over about 600,000 rand a month in that studio, which yes. was insane. I mean, you'd walk in there, there would be Louis Vuitton bags on every treadmill reserving the treadmill. It was great. <laughs> it, was, it was a good time in South Africa. Anyway, I, I, I still wanted more and I still wanted to come to New York and I had an opportunity to bring Sweat 1000 to New York. So I had some guys who were ready to invest. They wanted me to be the major shareholder in the business because I was the biggest risk coming here and my partners in South Africa didn't see it the same way. So I just said, you know, let's, let's part ways. And, and I did. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't as amicable as I would have liked it to be, but often in business deals, things aren't that way. And you know, I rose above it. Uh, I, I ended up losing the deal of of switch of Sweat 1000 in New York because it just didn't happen. So I went back to the drawing board. And I, even when I had Sweat 1000, I always said, there's more. There's more. This is, you know, it's a great workout and it is. It's still going. Um, blast's going, Sweat's going. But I said, people don't love the treadmill. Not all people love the treadmill. So... How do I get around that? I don't want any barriers to entry. I want to share my, my love with everybody. So I came up with Switch Playground, which uh, I would go to yoga every day. And that that's actually what saved me, that, that focus on uh, doing yoga. Um, I created Switch Playground on the yoga mat. Um, <laughs> and Kelly Saunders, who was my right-hand woman in, in Sweat 1000, was instrumental in helping me create Switch Playground and fine-tuning it. And, I found a site in Cape Town. I, I went again, full, you know, I never tried this. I, I found a few guys that I, I started training at Virgin. In fact, they asked me to leave Virgin because they thought I was doing personal training there. I wasn't, I was just working with these new guys trying to you know, figure out my concept. And I still remember I planned to open, I think it was middle or early November, 2014. And the studio was delayed. The equipment coming from the US, I air freighted in because it was taking so long, which you know, I can imagine what that cost. And they delivered the equipment. We couldn't get it up the stairs. I had to get a crane and 
take a huge window out on the second floor to bring them to <laughs> talk about figuring shit out, you know. Um, but I had eventually delayed it so much that on the week that we were opening, the gym was meant to be completed on the Monday and on the Saturday I had full classes booked and on the Sunday full, everyone wanted to see what Stevie or I are doing next. So did I. Um, <laughs> and in theory, I had this brilliant concept. Friday at two o'clock, the gym's finally ready. So now the next day I've got three sold out classes of all these people have been following me and after this phenomenon, what's he doing now? And I'd still never done a class. So I get friends and family and my trainers and the DJ and the, I had the, like in the old circuits, there used to be the green lights and the red lights of Virgin, you know, so I had that built and I did this class and I hated it. It was nothing like I envisioned in my head happened in real time. Uh. So I called Kelly into the room. I said, listen, two hours we sat, we banged out a different plan. I took the lights out. I said, go with your watch. You teaching at six o'clock tonight. I want to be in the class. I can feel it. Let's do it. And, and Switch was born after two classes, literally. Mm -hmm. And the next day we had people and it, it's been ever since. And I, I actually, um, we've, we've fine-tuned it along the way, obviously, hugely and made big changes. But that was, that was the birth of Switch Playground. And to be honest, that was the only class I'd ever done. So four months ago when I did my second class of Switch after teaching probably 7,000 of them, I literally have only done two classes. Um, but I write the programming every single day the world over. And you know what it is. It's just a natural involvement of taking, I think, 30, 33 years of studying, of dedicating my life to human movement, studying human movement, practical application for helping people to train the way they live. And I've, I've packaged my thesis into Switch Playground. So this is where we are now. <laughs> Wow, man. It's amazing, like, uh, listening to, you know, I guess the ups and downs and, you know, what a journey it, it has been. Uh, it's, uh, I haven't even touched on all the downs. But anyway, uh, no. yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey. And, and one of the things, like, which I've, I've heard you sort of mention on other podcasts and stuff, uh, and a lot of it revolves around, like, mindset and the type of person that you are. Like, you've been super successful, obviously, and you've mingled with a lot of um, – really sort of big names and stuff, but th there's a certain way of being with people that actually gets you there. You know what I mean? And one of the things that you talk about is authenticity. Mm -hmm. So how has that helped you in your endeavors and your success? And what else do you think has helped you as a person? Humility, ego, and by ego, I mean lack of. I, I, I believe ego is the biggest killer of most people's success. For me, ego is a projection of an image you want people to think you are when you haven't earned it. That's my analogy of what ego is. It's a belief that you are something you aren't because of an insecurity. And I believe, especially in New York, this industry is so driven by ego uh, that I think it hurts people. So humility, ego, and I definitely believe in, 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 in what you have to offer the world um, in authenticity. So... For example, another concept launched in New York the same month that we launched Swift, uh, Switch Playground here. And these guys came in. They've done what I wanted to do. They came in. They've been around two years. They've been bought out by Equinox. They've gone national. The difference between me and them, firstly, their program is not, clear, not nearly as good as ours. And I'll say that hands down by... Uh, by my own attempts at it uh, and by those who've tried it. And, and anyone who knows human movement will come to that class and come to my class and say, this is the best workout. I have awesome results. They don't. And again, I'm, I, let me put this to you in this way. I don't compete with anybody else. I worry about what we're doing and that we're better today than we were yesterday. And I tell that to my teams. I believe that if we are in fitness, we have the gift to wake up every day and help people be better. Whether you're going to bury boot camp, soul cycle, rumble boxing, whatever it is you choose to do, include us in your mix is all I ask. Don't exclude them and only have us. I'm not saying we are everything, but switch is everything because it does offer everything. Soul cycle on a bike, batteries on a treadmill and floor. At switch playground, you're literally doing every element of exercise there is from cardio, core, functional, 
uh, strength. It's quite a yoga. Every, every, literally every element is, is in there. But authenticity is, is the rule. So these guys, as I said, the difference is their lead instructor came in with, he was the Steve Uriah of New York. In, by saying that, I mean, if I opened a concept in South Africa, because I was the pioneer in boutique fitness there, people want to know what I'm doing. And they want to support that. Because there's two boutique gyms in South Africa still, and they're both mine. Uh, one, both my creations, I should say. Um, so they had that. They were also a nominal um, entertainment group backed. Uh, they have the biggest nightclub and restaurant brand in, the, in New York and California. They've got the lists of clients. They've got the promoters. They've got everything. They did everything right. Their marketing has been incredible. Uh, so they came in. They shot the lights out from day one. They were just, they flew. I came in. I used to walk in. Literally, there would be three clients. Now, I've come from Cape Town where I had 80 people fighting to get into classes. And now there's three. And I'm going to sit with 10 million people. And I'm walking around going, what the fuck? Like the first weekend we opened, we had all these cool clothes. No one bought anything. And I was like, what's going on? This place isn't what I thought it was. But no one knew me well. We had to gain trust. People had to understand. I never sold my story. To this day, I still haven't fully sold my story to the New Yorkers. The fact that it comes from South Africa is actually credible. I'm not just some New York trainer who's decided to throw this thing together. I've brought a brand that's highly successful in a third world war, an emerging market, to the most volatile competitive markets. It takes balls. And we came in, we took two huge flagship studios, completely shouldn't have, but did. Um, and we never marketed till four months ago, not once. And it's, it's nearly two years old. And only now are we figuring it out. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a grind. I'm telling you, I've, I've questioned life more times than... In the two years I've been in New York, I've learned more about people, business, and myself than I have in, in 48 years prior. You know, um, it's, it's an education unlike anything. So, yeah, I mean, coming into New York literally has been... A game changer for me. I do believe you can go anywhere else in the world after surviving New York and be brilliant because, again, no one's here to be mediocre. So everyone who's here is, is trying to get to the top. And in order to get to the top, you'll do whatever it takes. So you have to know that even people on your team will fuck you to get to what they want to get to. So you wake up every day with that knowledge. Uh, I'm a very trusting person. Um, I'm learning not to be <laughs> because, <laughs> because you know what, if you don't expect, you don't get disappointed. Uh, that's, that's something I've learned the hard way. So I'd rather expect less and be, you know, surprised and, and encouraged by surprise that, wow, this guy's actually cool and he's actually into it. And he's, you know, then I thought you were my guy. I hired a guy who was my, my um, from the big box Equinox chain, who was my general manager. And we literally went through days together, um, clawing through the worst times, you know, questioning why, what are we doing wrong? Why are people coming back and studying? And, you know, and, and he's, I've got your back, bro. We're doing this together. And then one day he just walked in and said, I'm leaving you, bro. And it was like a knife in the heart because this was my right-hand man, you know, mm. a year into being here. And, and we were starting to grow, but he, he took another opportunity that was better. And that said, you know what, you're on your own. Don't rely on anyone and, and figure it out, figure it out. And I've come, there's that saying, I haven't come this far to come this far. And that's the truth. Uh, I haven't, I, I have um, at the moment requests from Tel Aviv, London, Australia, um, Dubai, Mumbai, Shanghai, <laughs> uh, the world, one switch. I was in LA last week looking at some potential sites. I've hired a, uh, so what I've, what I've figured out I need to do is, you know what, I'm brilliant. And I am. I'm brilliant at what I do. Uh, but I'm not brilliant. I'm, I, and, and, and I believe for every entrepreneur, the first thing you need to learn is know what you're brilliant at, but identify what you aren't. And I know I don't do numbers. I know I don't do the business side. I love what I do so much, I'll give it away. I'll, oh, you can't afford it. You know, I just I guest you in. I ended up having 20 guests in my class because I, I want people to enjoy what I do. But I've had to go and hire the equal brilliant team around me at what they do. So 
accounting, business, all that stuff, I'm now putting in place the people that are the me of that division. And we're starting to see a huge change. I've hired a guy as our CEO now. Um, there's a gym called Crunch. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, or if you aren't, Crunch Gym in the 90s was a boutique little studio. And this guy, Roger, took it from that to a $100 million national chain. Um, he's joined us. He said to me, and he's not blowing smoke up my, my, my ass. He's literally said to me, I see more potential. I'm more excited about being in this brand than I have in anything else I've done. And he's, he's really sat on boards and been involved as, as a consultant for some major, major brands. And he's now my full-time CEO. And I've got a company that are, um, I guess, a consulting company that have come on board who have dealt with some of the biggest brands globally in fitness. Uh, in, the, in the fitness space, they're on my team now. So finally, we're at a point now where I can actually say, you know what, I, I, I do see the light. Uh, I've had so many moments of like, what the fuck am I actually doing here? But in saying that, I've always known that that switch is amazing. I mean, today I had a meeting with a guy who's a potential investor and he said, I love you, Stephen, you're brilliant, but there's only one of you. Mm -hmm. And I've had that question. And you know, the truth is, I'm sharing my love with the world via others. I'm letting other people tell my story. And in that, I mean, in South Africa, there's four stores open now. They're all getting the retraction. They're all, I'm not there, uh, but they're telling my story. And I just make sure they tell it right. You know, so I write the class every day. I do the programming. Um, I'm the face of it. I, I will continue to be, uh, you know, like I said, turning 50 in, in a few months time striving to be better than I was when I was 20. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, that's part of the selling point is people go, my God, I can't believe it. I thought you were 40 or 38 or whatever. I'll say 25, but they've never said that. But, um, <laughs> but it's because authenticity. That's why. That's great advice. Uh, I think getting to know yourself that well and knowing the, the, the positive and negative points is, I think, super good advice. But while you're giving some good advice, maybe you can give us some advice sort of for people looking to improve their overall health and well-being. What are like some of the top three tips for like someone that's wanting to just improve overall their health and well-being? Okay. So my first tip is do it. <laughs> yeah. My first tip is don't say Monday. And you'll see in my Instagram posts, I say that and I believe in it. Go now. Go tonight. What's tomorrow? Why? Why wait? You know, like, when you're hungry, you eat. You know, you don't say, fuck, I'm starving, I'm gonna have lunch tomorrow. You know, True. it's dinner time. I tell people who are overweight that say, I can't go into a gym or I can't do it. The fact that you are overweight and you've walked into a gym, any professional will embrace you and will help you. If I see someone who's really overweight in the gym, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna fucking make sure they know they're in the right place. Mm -hmm. If I see someone who's heavily overweight in the McDonald's, I'm gonna judge that. Because for me, they're not wanting to be better. But if you want to improve, I'll take your hand and I'll fucking help you. Um, believe in it. And the change starts now. It's not about diets on Monday or the 1st of Jan. So that you align yourself. Let me give myself another four months to just fuck everything up. And then in January, I'll start. But I already know I'm going to fail because I'm not really committing because I'm giving it a date. But that's not really what I'm going to do. Because when I get there, I'll do it for a few days and I'll be like, oh, fuck, I'll do it on Monday. The mentality is start now. Um, start slow. It's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, changing lifestyles is imperative. It's not about, uh, I don't, I believe in goals. I do believe set a goal because it'll get you on a path. But often when we achieve a goal, we then slip off it and say, I did it. Or we don't achieve a goal and we feel like we failed. So we think, fuck, I can't do this. So I say, if you change your diet 30%, your body will change 30%, your lifestyle will change 30%. If you don't do any exercise and you go walk four blocks today, it's four more than you did. And then do eight blocks and then start slow and be realistic. Uh, don't look at a Victoria's Secret model and say, I want to be here when you're a five foot three Jewish girl whose genetics aren't going to allow that. Or when I say Jewish, I just know I've dealt with a lot of Jewish girls. It's the truth is, be the best you can be for you. Um, set a real goal. Set a, again, if you set yourself up for failure from day one, you're not going to get there. So 
I'm five foot seven and a half. I'm not going to be a six foot three guy. It's not going to happen. Uh, you know, there's no drugs around that are going to help that happen. But what I've done with my frame, uh, you know, you look at my people's own genetics. My father's obese. You know, they have no disrespect. Um, <laughs> my mom's tiny. I'm not genetically athletic. I'm not genetically gifted like some of these people. Oh, sure, we all have equal opportunity. Some people have a better opportunity. Uh, you see these guys walking around there perfect, you know, muscle, bellies, thin joints, they have, they have an advantage, but that doesn't make them the best. I used to tell these football players, I said, guys, here's the deal. You've got four or five years to be in the NFL. I said, you're young. You don't see there's an end that's going to happen. I said, why don't you want to be the number on the field people from other teams even come watch? You know, you've made it here. Don't just be a number. Be a number. When I used to go watch Michael Jordan play against Atlanta Hawks, he was the Chicago Bulls. I went to see him. I was a, 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 a Hawks fan, but I wanted to see a legend play. I wanted to see Magic Johnson. I wanted to see Charles Barkley, the dream team, because they have risen to the very top. So these kids would come in and I'd be, guys, you're eating McDonald's. I said, let me ask you a question. You've got a Ferrari or a whatever car. Do you put regular gas in or do you put premium in? No, I put premium in. I said, so? Why would you not put premium in, in your own self, you know? Um, so for me, you know, it's choices. And, you know, imagine how much better you'd be if you ate properly when you get on the field. Imagine how much more effective you would be, how your recovery would be. And that's what I say to people uh, in life, you know. It's not about a 20 minute or 30 minute workout. It's about a lifestyle. It's how you feel after. It's for me, switch playground starts on the playground, transcends into everyday life. You become more productive at work. You've got more energy. You go home, you get up with your kids, you go run outside. People I've, I've trained in the past who used to sit on, you know, borderline diabetic, overweight, came to sweat 1000 at the time, became triathletes, changed their lives. Everything changed. It's not about. It's choices and it's a lifestyle. So um, mindset is the first thing uh, because at the end of the day, exercise hurts. Exercise is boring. Exercise, find something that works for you. Get your music, play it. Be your Rocky. Play Rocky and be Rocky. <laughs> Do what it takes. Motivate yourself. A big question I get often, Steve, what happens when you lack motivation? I say, well, then I rely on discipline. Yeah. So uh, motivation won't always be there. I'd, I get up some mornings at five and I'm like, God, I can fucking sleep. And I'm like, New York's freezing in winter. I don't want to go and put on 500 layers in the snow and walk to go to the gym. But my discipline makes me. I, I know that after the fact, I'm going to feel amazing. And the guy who slept in and got up late is dragging and I'm kicking ass already when he's crawling out of bed. And I always believe in, don't think about the now, think about the reward. Live in the now, be present always. But there's a goal. So when you do something, you have a very clear goal of why you're doing it and, and you go forward. Cut out sugar, all of you. Cut out sugar. Sugar is, for me, the biggest evil on the planet. It causes inflammation. I'd say the single biggest cause of cancer through research, sugar. Um, corn syrups, garbage. Just cut out sugar. People say, oh, you know, there's a high fat and low carb and there's the... Atkins and there's uh, Banting and all these, it's simple. You will lose body fat if you take in less calories than you burn. If you burn, it's a simple equation. Calories in, calories out. That's the easiest way of looking at it if you want to lose body fat. The makeup of those calories is crucial. So where do they come from? Um, and how does my body utilize them? So some people can have more carbs than others. I say to everybody, low glycemic carbohydrates that don't impact your blood sugars and are slow release will always stand you in good stead. Oatmeal, sweet potatoes, those sort of things will hold you up for a long period of time. Cut out carbs at night because you don't burn them off necessarily. They store this glycogen or glucose. They can turn to fats. Simple, but cut out sugars. Simple sugars for sure. Candy, chocolates. Now, dark chocolates and, and, and a high percentage of cocoa fine. Antioxidant has qualities. Think about everything you put in your body as what is this doing for me? It's not a calculated thing. Life's already too complicated. Diets don't work. I'm not saying this is a regimented way, but just think. I'm going to eat this. What is it doing for me? Now, it doesn't mean to say that on a weekend, 
when I say a cheat meal, I don't believe in a cheat meal. I believe your body wants something. So on a, on a weekend, you want a burger and fries, go for it, okay? But then the next day, just get back on to the, the regular eating, you know, and, and eat well and feed your body well. As I said, you know, if you, if you go and invest in a fine automobile, you will do everything in your power to care for it. If you buy a beautiful watch, you're going to make sure it's looked off. You put it away carefully. You don't scratch it. Your body is the best gift you've got. So you are you. What gives you the right to fuck that up? You know, uh, take care of that shit. You know, it's, it's, it's your body. You've got to live in it. And that's the truth. And when people experience healthy and feel what it feels like, they, they, they're going to just say, why didn't I do this 20 years ago? You know, so. Yeah, so totally. that's, that's, yeah. that's cool, man. And uh, one thing that you just said there that like really resonated with me and I'm definitely going to use it in my writes up. That's for sure. was, you know, when the motivation's gone, you rely on discipline and that's, Absolutely. that's power, but, and that's, that's your whole life. You know, your whole life has been about learning that discipline and that's what makes you who you are now and why you've done so well. Well, and, I just, I want everybody to know that I'm not special. Uh, there's nothing special about me. I just, I just created the person I am. I believe in it. I, I'm, I'm really not special. I get messages all down Instagram, bro, you're South African, we're so proud of you. It's amazing. You know what, I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate it. I do because getting credit for what you do is cool. Uh, it validates the war that you're fighting. But I'm doing it because I want everybody to experience it. So the big thing now in fitness is streaming workouts. Um, and I'm, listen, I'm always looking at new things. And I will continue to do so. Uh, the hardest part for me is is having left my family, uh, and when I say left, in it's never left. They're with me every day, but but not being with them physically. My parents are getting older. It's a major sacrifice. Um, but I'm it's a sacrifice in my my vision. Um, you know, I'm going through a lot at, at home with my youngest. Uh, I'm so proud of him. Uh, I embrace what he's going through and what he's doing. And he's a pioneer. He's, my goal is to help others in the world. Mm. His goal is to help others in his way. And he is, uh, and you mentioned it when you wrote, you know, what you want to discuss with my transgender child. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's been, uh, it might be one of your questions, it might not, but to talk about it a little bit, it, it's, uh, it's again, drawing on, what is our purpose in life? You know, as a parent, your purpose is to have healthy children that are happy. Um, when you're given a situation where your child is in the wrong body, uh, you question everything for a while. Uh, you research, you look it up, and you figure out that I don't care what it is. Uh, how can I help my child be happy? Um, and for me, the fact that my daughter at 13 was no longer going to be my daughter it was a very, very difficult thing for me. She was my, she was my little princess, you know? And, and when she first said to me, dad, do you ever feel like you're in the wrong body about two years ago? I said, what are you talking about? You know? And I, I ignored it. And we went bikini shopping and she really wasn't into it. You know, it's like, that's a beautiful bikini. You know, I want the shorts one with the, with the like sports top. I never saw it, you know? She was always a tomboy. She was always different. She always go to a party and they'd put on the party dress. She'd hate it. Never wanted to do her hair. You know, there were so many signs looking back now. Um, but when it came to me and my wife presented me with a real story, like, babe, I think, you know, I need to tell you this. Karen is transgender, you know, and I was like, bullshit, it's attention, looking for attention, it's a fad. It's the same reaction every parent has in research I've seen. And, you know, and shame on me for, not shame on me, I guess it's a natural instinct, but I'm so proud of, of, of what Luke now has become. We're going through a lot all the time. It never ends. Uh, hormones and we did hormone blockers first, which really messed him up. He got sick. He was almost bedridden for three months. It was a very rare case. Um, then we started testosterone to, to, you know, begin the journey of transitioning to a man. And we're at a, we're at a crossroads now because now it's time for surgery, um, top surgery. And it's been tough that I'm not there. Um, you know, I, I 1 million percent support that child. I'll, I'll, 
you know, I get so mad when people bully and I, I have to step back and say, just objectively look at this, just take an opinion, take a stance. These people are uneducated. Think about it. When you're at school, if a kid was suddenly a transgender, we would have beaten them up and bullied them. That's mm. the mentality. Yeah. There's so much of it now with the, with the millennials and the Gen Zs. When I talk, you know, I've got a transgender child. Oh, that's so cool. I've got four. My kids got four in the class or my, I've got roommates. So it's very, very normal. Mm. Uh, I find myself still being closed-minded. The two days, you know, New York, anything goes. Two days ago, a guy stood next to me about six foot three with a beard in a dress, high heels and makeup. And I looked at this guy and thought, what are you fucking freak? And I, I, I stopped myself and I said, hang on a second. Who the fuck are you to judge? A, that dude's probably way happier than you. B, that's what makes that dude happy. And C, it's not your fucking lane. Stay in your lane, let him stay in his lane. I actually train a androgynous model here named Rainbow, who's very famous and a very big advocate for, um, it's, it's more, I, I think it's a little bit different than transgender, but doesn't identify as anything. Double D breasts, six foot three. I'm not quite sure what sex physically it is. It doesn't matter. He, he doesn't care. And he gets attacked. She, I think it identifies as she. She gets attacked by everybody. You freak, you this, and just handles it. And, and I put her in touch with Luke. And she said the most brilliant thing, if you're going to be an advocate for this, Go to debating club. Learn to educate. As a human being, we have rights. Our rights are food, water, a roof over our head, and to be who we want to be. And no one has the right to question that. So if someone says, oh, you're a freak. No, no, you're not. I'm not a freak. This is how it actually works. It's not a choice. I was born with a male brain, but my body's different. And they carry on. Then you say, you know what? You don't understand. You're not ready to learn. So stay in your lane. I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm not interfering with your life. Go on. Do your thing. You're small-minded, but that's your deal. And then move on. And I'm trying to teach Luke that because he gets he gets attacked and, and he gets angry. You know? And I don't blame him. In a lot of ways, I want to go smash people to pieces all the time to defend. But at the same time, try educate. And and if you can't, then just ignore You know. Um, but that's one of the hard things for me is, is uh, you know, you're fighting so many wars on so many fronts that... Uh, again, drawing on that did you die? Yeah. You know, yeah. For me, um, I don't feel sorry for any part of me. I've chosen this. I chose it. So I, often days I'll be walking going, oh, fuck, I'm working so hard. And you know, fuck you to me. This is me to me. You know, <laughs> you chose this. You didn't have to be here. But now you're here and you've got the opportunity. So get the fuck up and do it. You know, don't. It's easy to, to lie down and feel sorry for yourself and eat a cookie and cry in your room. What's that going to do for you? Get up, figure it out, and fucking make it happen. And that's the truth, you know, for anybody. Don't, self-pity is, is a weakness. And, and I don't have my weakness. I, I've, I've learned that. I've learned that, yeah, we're allowed to feel down. I mean, you're a human being. But in that, draw from that and make a negative, a positive. I tell people that are depressed, that are smoking weed and drinking alcohol, I said, you know, you just make the negative more negative. So you're going to now be miserable with a hangover, you know? Yeah. Do something about it. Change it. I stand for change. If you're not happy, change. I've, again, I've changed many times. Situations haven't worked out for me. Life never does work out the way you want it to. You know, they say, you know, you plan and God laughs, you know, because... The truth is, it's not in your hands. Yeah. But take the cards you dealt and, and do the best you can with them. You know, that's what yeah. I can say. Yeah, for sure. Well, well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, thanks a lot for, for sharing that. That was definitely something we wanted to get onto. And, you know, what you just said now as well, I think in life, people don't necessarily want to take responsibility. They kind of want things just to kind of go easy, which is, which is a bit of a shame, you know, because if we all did take, take responsibility for things, it would be so much better, you know, we'd be moving forward uh, yeah, that much quicker. Absolutely. And, and Steve, one of the things that you've kind of like touched on now, um, obviously with Luke, Luke has, I guess, given you kind of a different perspective on life overall. And you also wrote a post on Facebook, which went viral I haven't yeah. actually read it yet, and Craig hasn't either. But what what did you write there, and how has that kind of, yeah, been? So for you? As a father, um, 
who's been in and around MMA fighters and fitness. I have a huge social media following. I, I, I looked at this situation that we had as a family when Luke was coming out. And I said, you know what? We're going to get questioned. Uh, we, the Jewish community of, of Cape Town is going to have their little say, as, as which I don't care. What people think of me, I don't care about, honestly. It's not my business. Uh, I wanted the world to know the, the truth. And, and for me, in research, the suicide rate in, in transgender children is extremely high. The reason being that their own parents don't accept what their children are. Again, you want to blame something else. Oh, it's this one's fault. No, it's, it's not anyone's fault. It's not a choice. Luke didn't choose to be this. Luke wakes up in the morning and wants to, he's a man. And he looks down and he's trapped in a woman's body. Can you imagine anything more frustrating? It's like you're a prisoner in your own body. Uh, and Luke's not alone. It's huge. There's a, well, I keep referring to Jew. It's, it doesn't matter religion, but there's a Jewish Facebook group from my wife's on groups on WhatsApp of thousands of transgender children. You know, when we were growing up, they were transvestites, freaks, didn't understand, gay, lesbian, labeled. You know what? It's study in Israel is, is, is very deep from the time that a, a child is conceived. What causes transgender? Too much testosterone goes to the brain of a female. In essence, we're all born with a female genital. And a clitoris literally deforms into a male uh, penis and you become a male. And the hormones are subsequently usually balanced and, and you become man or woman. It's, it's, you identify as a certain sexuality. There's, there's so many things. So I always thought, you know, Luke's different. Maybe he's a lesbian, you know, as a kid because he's a tomboy and he's not into this. And I made jokes even, Luke's a lesbian. You know, I think Luke's a lesbian. But in retrospect, when it came down to what's really happening here, I watched the show Katie Couric uh, put together um, the gender revolution or whatever it was called. It was an hour and a half where they had interviews across the world. And believe it or not, research, Israel is one of the highest, I mean, in everything in the medical world, Israel is something to be proud of. But they've done so much research into transgender. And that made me comfortable. That answered all my questions. And I saw all these parents asking the same thing. Uh, attention, it's a phase, we'll go out of it. Let's not do anything radical. You know what? Deal with it. Let him dress as a letter dress as a boy. She'll get over it. No, you know it's not happening. Uh, the truth is, this is where you're at. So I, I wanted Luke. Luke, Luke's biggest fear was that I wouldn't accept Luke. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I always said I will support you through everything as a parent. Uh, you know, I don't like weakness. So if you become a drug addict, I will uh, try and help you as, as much as I could uh, because I'm your parent. Um, but those are choices, kind of. It becomes a disease, a sickness, something different to deal with. But I wanted Luke to know that I, as the proud father, on behalf of his mom, his family, and myself, put out that message on Facebook to the world to say, I accept that I've lost my daughter today, but I welcome my son. Um, it was in a, a lot more words than that. I was actually sitting on my bed listening to, uh, you know, my favorite opera music, believe it or not. And, and, and it just flowed and I cried my eyes out and I wrote this post and I hit send and thought nothing further, to be honest. And, the reaction was a mind fuck. My parents, my parents in law, my family, my extended family got messages from the world. I had 700 reposts wow. uh, uh, or shares. I had likes, I had calls, I had messages, I had schools, teachers at schools in the Midwest messaging me to ask if they can share my story with the school with this uh, you know it was insane and uh, i had a conference call with the principal of camps bay when it was going to come out to the, 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 the grade and he was phenomenal in, in, in assisting that let luke use the staff bathrooms because of the gender issues and 
Uh, we've had funny moments with it in, in the different things that have gone on. And uh, I am so, I'm so happy that we did do this because there have been kids that have been subjected to hell by their fathers who wouldn't accept. They've read my notes and they've changed. Um, I've spoken to several. I uh, am an advocate for for parents and transgenders. I, I'm lucky that I have a platform and that I do have a certain status uh, that people listen to um, because I'll use that only for the purpose of education. I don't look at myself as anything other than a normal person. I'm not, uh, like I said earlier, I'm not special. Anyone can do what I've done uh, if you just believe in yourself and I've but because I do have a certain social outreach and belief, I will, I will let the world know that what, what we've been through, why? Because I want to help others. Um, and, and, and I've seen how Luke's helped others. And my wife has been exceptional in, in teaching me to accept and, and educating me in what Luke's going through and, and, and helping me to understand it when I've doubted certain things. She's, She's been a strength and she's, she's really been phenomenal. And she's actually quite a pioneer and leader in many groups in South Africa. Um, and truthfully, the world now, there's people from all over who've reached out. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't do the post for any other reason than to show Luke that I believe in him. I'm proud of him. I think he's amazing. Uh, uh, so it was for that reason. But I wanted the world to know that I, as a father and Robin as a mother, accept one billion percent what our child is and embrace it and will help others for the same issue, you know. Wow. Uh, what an incredible story. So thankful thank you for sharing that with us. And you know, you, you spoke about it earlier, talking about how you want to actually help others. And I think you help others on way more levels than, than you might even realize with this kind of thing as well. You know, not just in the with your gyms, but um, I think that's really, really special. But one or two things you mentioned there really stood out for me a little bit earlier was, you know, the millennials and that a lot more people coming out as saying that it's perhaps that they're transgender. But I presume that that must have just existed all along, you know, except that, you know, there never was a way of being able to do that. And I think it's quite encouraging that, that that's people are being able to do that. Now that's an encouraging sign that people are being more embracing, even though they're obviously having, there's still a lot of crazy, people out there that are not or totally ignorant let's say right. and that brings me to my second point is that I think one of the coolest things you said there was to uh, tell um, Luke to you know get in there learn how to talk and explain and debate and communicate well because I do think the root of all of that is is probably ignorance you know and Very much um, so. um yeah so, so thank you for that I think that's yeah. great advice absolutely uh, that's again everyone's got a right to be who they want to be and if it doesn't suit you and your lifestyle and they're not affecting you or hurting you, then stay in your lane and let them stay in theirs. You know, you've got no rights. Judge yourself. That's the only person you have the right to judge. 100%. 100%. And um, Steve, so what, uh, what does the future look like for you? It sounds like it's really exciting. It sounds like there's going to be lots more ups. It sounds like it's going to be a few more downs. What are you... So I'm, ready for, you... I'm ready for them oh, yeah. all. Um, I carry on living my truth. I carry on being authentic. I wake up every day uh, ready for whatever's coming uh, because there will be disappointments, there will be fights, there will be challenges, but there will be highs. I plan to expand, um, switch playground, absolutely. I plan to expand the Steve Uriah brand in the outreach of, of, of whatever it is that it takes, helping others in any area, um, whether it comes across as streaming uh, workouts and or like Johnson, I, I'm so proud of him. You know, you guys, I know are friends with him. Uh, he spends time with me in New York. Every time he's here, he really makes me feel like I'm a rock star because he's so positive. He's amazing. And he's, his, his mind is just so brilliant and, and his futurism and ideologies and his knowledge and just being in his presence is so, I, I'm, I'm so fortunate that he, when he comes to town, he sort of like inflates me to, to believe even more in, in what I'm doing. Um, I would love to share platforms like he does. Uh, 
I don't necessarily, I'm not, I don't think it's a life coach or motivational speaker. I don't think there's a category for it. I know I am, um, I'm gifted in, in, in certain areas. I, I'm, and I've realized that only by people telling me, you know, when I have even start meetings and I stand up and talk, obviously people say, fuck, you're an amazing speaker. That was brilliant. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I swear I just spoke. It's like, so you know what, if that is something I can embrace down the line and, and share with the world, uh, I don't look at myself as an Anthony Robin, you know, like let's all clap and, and this is how life should be lived. I love what they do. I think it's amazing. Um, but I'm sure there's a lane I'll find that eventually I'll be in. I don't think I can be jumping around forever. Um, I know that in my life, my, you know, for me, success isn't defined by a bank account. Uh, it's defined by how many people's lives I've changed for the better. I know along the path and all the places I've lived and the way I've gone, I've paved the road for many, many successful trainers that have been under me for many, you know, years or however long and they've gone off on their own. They've started their own thing. Their outreach has been endless. Um, so in life, my belief is, you know what, it's a, it's a short life, have value, add value, leave a footprint um, on the world, not in being a superstar and how many followers you had and you verified, because fuck that. I mean, it's great to, to be all that. But what do you do with that? Like I said, when I had, you know, I have a social media presence, I'm using that not to market product to make money, but to, to share knowledge on transgender or diet or wellness. So for me, the future is actually living in the present, carrying on with what I do. And what will be, I, I, my plan is to, again, expand the playgrounds, um, but if I look back and say, you know, you know, you, you define success or, or what do you believe is success? I've been successful in in my goal. My my life was meant to be that of someone who would wake up every day and help others, um, and I have, uh, and I continue to, and I'm just proud of all the people who've always believed in in what I've taught them and then taken it. Whether they've ended up being my competition, whether they ended up having a business that I started. I have no regrets. Uh, I thank them all for carrying my message, you know, and I was, I was very fortunate to live the life I do. I wake up every day and I don't go to work. I wake up every day and I do what I love. Um, it's hard some days as, as in anything, but yeah. So for me, you know, I tell anybody, leave a footprint, make a difference, change a life, change one, change a million, whatever it is. It's not about what, what you put in a bank and what car you drive. Cause at the end of the day, I told John the funny story. I, I had a Bentley in, in Atlanta, you know, when I was a car, I became one of the football players that I trained. I like <laughs> phase of having these cars and motorbikes. And I got in the Bentley and I was driving and I was fucking stressing. I was in traffic, I was hooting and I was sitting at a light, fuck this. And you know, then a guy in front of me was in an old pickup truck and there was no air because the windows were open. It was a hot Atlanta day and he was sitting dancing at a robot, at a, at a traffic light. And I'm in this car that I've always aspired to that's huge. It's a leather lounge suite with a rocket ship engine that's the finest automobile in the world. And I couldn't wait to get out. I couldn't wait to get to where I was going. And in front of me was a guy in an old fucked up car loving the journey. And that defined a lot for me there. And then I said, take a step back and realize what is it that is happy? What makes you happy? Uh, a car that you leave outside in the sun, in the rain, or that you get in and you can't wait to get out of, or is it you that's not happy? Because that dude in front of you in that old car is so happy, I hated him. I hated him because he was so happy. I resented him and I hate, but it wasn't him I hated, it was me. You know, the world is a projection, it's a mirror of you, if you look in it. And uh, so for me, success isn't the car you drive or the bank account you've got, it's, it's what you've done to change the world for the better. <laughs> Love it. There's, there's no way to say that any any better than that, uh, Steve. Thank you. And the GT Continental was that that's a pretty sweet car, though. To be honest, it was a beautiful um, fucking car. <laughs> really, it really was a beautiful car. But again, the plus side is I love cars, but I hate driving uh, because I get road rage and stuck in traffic. I used to valet park it. They put it right outside the front door of the restaurant. I was actually going to write a book 
afterwards saying it doesn't matter where the valet puts your car because at the end of the day, people were leaning on it, having pictures taken, and I'd walk out feeling a bit, you know, like, shy, this is, he has this white dude getting in this car. I was 30-something at the time. Is he driving his dad's car? Has he rented it? Uh, and I'd have to tip the valet $20 because I'm in such a cool car. So it ended up costing me, stressing me. I love the car, but if I could put it in my living room and, and look at it, great. But it, at the end of the day, did it make me happy? Nah, it didn't. Not at all. Yeah, yeah um, for sure. Wow, but powerful, powerful message there. That's for sure. So, so thank you so much for sharing it. Just, just before we finish off and, and say thank you, uh, I'm assuming you, uh, you're the same across all social media platforms, but if you can just let people know the best way to kind of get in touch and hold of you, that'd be yeah, great. Um, my Instagram is probably the, the easiest. It's, it's Steve Uriah, S-T-E-V-E-U-R-I-A. So I'm at Steve Uriah. I'm, I'm very active on that. Um, Facebook, same. Um, yeah. And you know, that's probably the easiest way to, to get in touch. I'm always happy to help questions, answers, you know, I'll get to it when I can. I, uh, I can only tell the world and everyone who listens to, again, believe in yourself. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, uh, don't be scared to, don't be scared to chase your vision. And again, a vision is a vision. A dream stays a dream. Uh, if you have a good product, you believe in it uh, and you do it properly, you can't fail. Uh, but it's not going to be a sprint, it's a marathon. Never stop believing. Also, another thing, as I said earlier, know your strengths, but more than that, know your weaknesses. Uh, identify them. Nobody's everything. Um, if you think you are everything, you're already lost. Uh, and, you know, um, it's just... It, it's, it's be the best you can be. Wake up tomorrow better than you were today. Promise yourself you will. Um, and, and don't wait for Monday and don't wait for January 1st. Get something done. Start right fucking now. You know, don't, don't, make, don't, don't make false promises. You can't lie to yourself. Yes. Awesome. Well, Steve, just briefly from my side, listen, I'm um, not going to keep it too long because there's, there's so many things I'd love to thank you about from this conversation we've had today. But uh, first of all, just slack it to have another chat to a good South African boy, which is, is always fun. So, and I dig that the artwork in the background just for yeah, it's cool, just, right? like a, it's a flag, uh, yeah. American and a South African flag sort of merging together. It's really, yeah. really cool. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for the super inspirational uh, energy and vision. And uh, I can't thank you enough. And I can't wait to see where you're heading and we'll next time Gareth and I are over that side of the world, we're definitely going to come and have a, have a great workout. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Listen, you. it's been an honor and a privilege to share. I, I appreciate your belief. I love the name of your podcast. Ridiculously human is amazing. Uh, you know, cause that's true. That's what we all are at the end of the day, you know? Um, and I think you guys are doing great work and it's been amazing being in, uh, in Portugal, in Australia, sitting in the rain in New York, and hopefully someone in South Africa is going to be, uh, you know, thinking here's three guys that uh, have spread and uh, and still are solid to South Africa because it's. I always say that there's nothing like it in the world. You know, I mean, unfortunately, there's definitely issues politically, but at the end of the day, I'm very, very, very grateful that I grew up there. It's, uh, it was it was a very, very, very special place, and still is. Um, I just hope that that they can find peace. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, Craig and I definitely both feel the same. It was an absolute pleasure growing up in South Africa. It just taught us so much about life and like got us to meet so many nice people and grow up as actually being decent people too, I think. There's a kind of ethics and moral kind of way of growing up in South Africa, which which helps us in life. And Agreed. yeah, Agreed. just... just, just yeah. Yeah, just briefly from me, just to say thanks so much for the chat. And um, if if all else fails for you, like, you know, the the exercise and switch playground and everything, you can definitely become a, a soothsayer, but because you preempted probably 95% <laughs> of the questions that we had for you. So I've there's done something. This a few times, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, listen, I, I, I just, I really do appreciate it the opportunity to share my story and, and uh, thank you guys for wanting to, to tell it. Um, so thanks yeah. a lot. Pleasure, man. Yeah. So it was, it was just like 
but there was so much in that chat and it was it was really powerful what you said um a lot of it resonated with me and i, I know a lot of it's going to resonate with our listeners um there's so much value in your story but also in how you tell your story and i can see that one day that stage is going to be all yours for sure you know there's you've you've learned so much in your life but and it just comes out like naturally like when you when you speak about it now and each sentence is like a lesson for somebody so thank you man and it's uh, it's been an honor i'm glad we managed to get this together yeah, even though the emails never went through, which I still don't understand. Uh, so weird. But as you could tell, my, techn my technological skills, <laughs> that's one of my weaknesses. We'll leave it there. <laughs> Classic. All right, okay, cool, man. Guys, well, thank that you was... for the opportunity and have a brilliant, is it day, night, wherever you are. So now, Aussie's there. see the kangaroo <laughs> behind you. Yeah. Uh, Portugal's probably night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Early morning. It's no, just like it's 10, 7 o'clock in the morning for me, waking up. Yeah. <laughs> are you in Sydney? No, I'm in on the Gold Coast uh, near Brisbane, just south of Brisbane. Okay, so um, you're going into summer now, so cool. Enjoy. Lekker. Yeah, you, uh, we were in New York recently, Gareth and I, and uh, yes, as we had, it was the best weather, man. It was mm -hmm. such a good time. So when we were had you a great guys time. There? July. Uh, September. Uh, yeah, right. July, July yeah. New York. Right, that's the time. Yeah, for yes, sure. Next time, it's going to bring me up. Oh, but no, totally, definitely. Bad. For sure, yeah, definitely. Well, yeah. have a Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, 